I was about to say good morning, but it's good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for sticking around. My name is Dave Carger. I'm the chief correspondent at Fandango. It is absolutely my pleasure to be here and to introduce two past Screen Actors Guild Award winners, actually very appropriate for this crowd, who were also nominated for Screen Actors Guild Awards this year for their electric performances in Steve Jobs. Please welcome Michael Fassbender and Kate Winslet. Okay, show of hands, so nice. who just saw this movie for the first time? Wow. Oh, great. I love it. Not bad, right? Um, obviously, working on dialogue and memorizing lines is nothing new. You guys have done it forever, particularly you, Michael, with, with lots of theater work. But it has to be way, way different when it's an Aaron Sorkin script. What are the different ways that you have to go about memorizing and learning the lines when it's as dense as Aaron's writing? Uh, well, I guess, you know, the process is the same. It's just there's just many more hours of it, really. Uh, I didn't have, you know, uh, really any social life <laughs> uh, for whatever it was, you know, four months. But I, I was feeling sorry for myself, and then I was speaking to Jeff Daniels, and he did it for six months, you know, uh, uh, when he was doing the TV show. So, um, newsroom. Uh, but yeah, you know, he was sitting there, and I think you know he used to look at me in the morning in the in the makeup chair, and he's like, "How are you doing?" <laughs> it's like, you know, hang in there. Uh, and uh, uh, it was yeah, it was just it's just one of those things because the dialogue is so good, because it's so rare to get something of that caliber. You just want to sort of spend as much time as you can with it because then, when you know you take it to the floor and you can really you know have fun with the likes of Kate here and just uh, really, yeah, have, have a laugh when you're shooting it. But all those sort of hours at home, that's the kind of boring part and um, the sort of, <laughs> you go a little crazy. <laughs> Actually, you go a lot crazy. Yeah. In this. <laughs> uh, is it solitary? Is it sitting with the script and just memorizing it or is it running it with someone who knows what they're doing too? Uh, no, for me, it was solitary um, for the most part. When I first got in December, I was, I ran it with a friend, sort of, you know, a little bit, but really, you know, it's the, it's just the hour. That's just the way I do it. I guess some people like to run it with, but uh, with other people, I just feel sorry for them because I do it so many times because I'm such a slow learner. <laughs> that, uh, I would get it's embarrassing. I would just get um, Happy New Year, by the way. Yes, Happy New Year, <laughs> And thanks for that lovely little standing O there. That was really, that's really meant a lot. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would quite honestly find any fucker I could to test me on my lines. <laughs> so Random people in the street. I mean, honestly, pretty much random people. <laughs> um, the, the, the main culprit being my 12-year-old son, Joe, because he is the only member of my little family who isn't dyslexic. So, uh, so my husband um, is is very dyslexic, as is my daughter. So reading out loud is just so super hard for them. And much as they would want to help, they'd be like, "Oh, mum, it's just too many words." Um, so, so my twelve-year-old would he he was actually the best. Um, but for me, I, I I did I just found you know just knuckling under and getting on with it and do and and f kind of finding whatever way I could really I think to to remember the the dialogue. Sometimes doing weird things like memorizing it and testing myself by writing it all down after yeah. I'd read it all through. I mean, crazy things like that. Um, and also... You're a pretty quick study too, though, aren't you? I'm I mean, not bad, she, actually. I'm not, not bad. I was like spot on at the, at the read-through. And I was like, shit. <laughs> you know, it was like, was we, it? we hadn't even started rehearsals yet, and there's Johanna Hoffman sitting beside me, and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> How do I get out of this job? <laughs> Somebody break my arm. I put my arm in the door. <laughs> so, Kate, how would you compare and contrast Joe's... Steve Jobs to Michael's Steve Jobs. <laughs> My son is an excellent actor. <laughs> no, obviously there's no comparison. 
does it help at all to go and watch some other Aaron Sorkin stuff, whether it is the newsroom or social network, to kind of get the rhythms or no? Fuck no. Yeah. <laughs> that was just really scary. <laughs> yeah. um, but also I think this film was, it was very different, I think, um, this one. Just because, you know, Danny has, has described this film as almost the second part of a trilogy, he feels, a sort of a Sorkin trilogy, starting with the social network. And I, I never saw it as that, actually, at all. Um, and it was, it was, it was just, yeah, it was different, very different. But you know, the one thing I will say that Aaron does do um, with his screenplays, which is wonderful for the actors and the director, is he doesn't tell you, he really doesn't describe how a scene should be in terms of physically or in terms of physical interaction between two characters. I mean, a, a lot of the there's no space in the page for that. No, there's <laughs> that's true. That's actually really true. <laughs> um, but a. Um, a, a lot of the conversations that we had with the real Joanna Hoffman ended up helping us a lot in terms of the actual physicality and sort of closeness and looseness between Joanna and Steve, which was not on the page. We couldn't see that stuff. So the hugs before a launch, you know, throwing their arm around each other, the sort of physical um, proximity to one another, all of that stuff did come directly out of conversations we had with Joanna, which was hugely helpful and, and was lovely to sort of feel as though we were in some way capturing the essence of the friendship that they had because they clearly were very, very good friends. Um, anyway, I've been talking too much. <laughs> I want to ask you the same question. Did you find it helpful to go back and watch any of Sorkin's other stuff? Um, I, I'm being totally honest. I just didn't have any time. Right. I mean, really, you know, from sort of we were rehearsing, and then if I wasn't rehearsing, I was learning lines at home, or I was watching, um, you know, seminars, speeches, interviews with Steve Jobs, and it really was that. It was a cycle of, you know... And then I would sleep for whatever was left of the, the night, and then the next day was the same thing. So literally, there was no time for anything else. Oh. Anything else would have been just a, 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 a massive luxury. And I thought, you know, I think just by the repetition of, I find, uh, of working with the text, I find in most things, but certainly with this, because it is written to a certain cadence and rhythm, that just through the repetition of it, I started to sort of crack the rhythms and started to find space within his rhythms where you could actually play your own rhythms. But it was just through that repetition that all the answers were there, you know, in the, in the script. And we did also have this um, really very, very unique rehearsal process that made I mean, we couldn't have done it. I mean, I know that you've said you couldn't have done it without that. And what we would do, because it is written in that sort of three-act structure, um, we rehearsed each act, and then we would stop, and we would film that act. And then we would stop filming and go back into rehearsal room and rehearse the second act. And then we would go and film it, and then we'd go back and do the third. And just just simply having, and was it 10 days for each act or two weeks, something like that. It's quite a long time we had for rehearsal. And just going over it and over it and over it, you know, by the time we got onto the set, Jeff has said this actually, we were already on performance 70 by the time we walked onto the set, which was unbelievable. I've never had anything like that before in my life. Yeah, we were just talking last night um, uh, that we'd love to, you know, to do it on stage just because at the end of... Um, each act, you know, let's say so we had the rehearsal period, so got to the Friday and we were going to start shooting on the Monday, we would run the entire act through in one go. And that's really when it, I felt it was, yeah. we all felt that it was at its most electric, it was, yeah. you know, it was pretty exciting. Did you guys have say in that structure to do it that way, rehearse, shoot, rehearse, shoot, rehearse, shoot, or was that just something that... That was Danny. And that was Danny. Dan did. Danny really pushed for that, and he really pushed to film it in San Francisco. And I know there was resistance because obviously those, both those choices were expensive. Right. Um, but I was so happy that we did shoot it in San Francisco. It's such a unique place. The fact that you know the, the birth of this sort of world that we're living in now really started there. The personal computer, and obviously Steve Jobs, and and just you know the uniqueness of the city, and also we got all those extras, you know. Oh my God, they were amazing. They all and just queued up. No yeah. one got paid. They just came and they yeah. were there for hours and hours, yeah. you know, and incredible. they kept cranking out this extraordinary Mexican sort of... waves. Yeah, and, like yeah. rock concert-like energy. I mean, they were just brilliant. They really were. Yeah. And Kate, I love that you've talked about how there were things in those rehearsals 
that you guys felt like you needed to kind of get out of your system. You've said that there was stuff that just wasn't working uh, in some of the early rehearsals, which I love that you that you kind of admitted that because when you see the finished product, you think, oh, it must have just been so electric and easy. But what wasn't always going right? Oh my God, so much wasn't going right. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the great thing about having rehearsal, you know, is that it was absolutely the the moment to make mistakes. And actually, I have to be honest, for me, it was a it was a real a real lesson that I'm going to carry for my life, I hope, because sometimes the first or the second or the third take is just about making mistakes. And I know that I have done things on screen that the director's gone, yeah, I'm really happy with that. And I'm like, what the fuck? No, that was dog shit, you know? And, and, and luckily we did all the dog shit in the rehearsal room. And, um, and, and it, I mean, we definitely did. You know, there were moments where Michael would say, oh, let's try it this way. And I think that's never gonna fucking work. <laughs> and, and we would do it and it wouldn't. And then similarly, I would say, oh, why don't we just do one where we just sit on the floor and, you know, have a nice chat? That didn't work either, you know. So we would do every version of it, and, and one of my favourite versions that Michael tried is in Act Three when there's the big scene with Fix It when Joanna pushes the things on the floor and that scene there. Michael said, "I'm going to do a whole, I'm going to do a whole <laughs> version of this now. I'm just going to <laughs> do a continuous yoga practice." And I was like, "Okay, <laughs> of course you are." Of course you are, and that's not going to work at all. (laughs) And he did it, and actually, a lot of it really did work, and hence, that's the reason why some of that, he's he's in his little downward dog and upward-facing dog, and that's from the rehearsal room. (laughs) I've got a yoga sort of video that's coming out later in the year that was just sort of an introduction (laughs) to that. But you know, the thing is, if I could just sort of uh, elaborate a little bit as well on that, that rehearsal thing, I think... You know, uh, maybe it's just a personal thing, sort of, but perhaps you guys feel like that as well, that you feel like you always have to sort of, you know, get it right uh, all the time with sort of acting, or I guess anything in life, really. But it's, I think, so much important, more important in a way to fail and to fall flat in your face. And that's really the what rehearsal should be used for, you know, to really mix it around, to really, you know, I remember there was times where, you know, Danny was like, that's great, let's do that again. I was, and we were like, no, let's not, you know, because you want to touch on it, but not like over sort of set it in stone. Because, you know, something that works in a rehearsal period two weeks ago and we're on set shooting that scene today was not going to work again. Time changes, you're in a different mood, different environment. To never get set in one idea and think, okay, that's it, you know. There's a million ways to do something. And to always keep that sort of um, uh, unexpected sort of element to it. Uh, and so, you know, the, the rehearsals are there to mess things up. And I always felt like I don't want to get too close to an end product in the rehearsal because, you know, um, funny because, you know, you, you were saying, Kate, you know, the first, two, first take is my favorite take. You know, because you've got nothing to lose on that take, and it's the f- and nobody knows what's going to happen. Remember, we were doing that walk and talk uh, at the on the first act. You know, right at the beginning of the movie, up the stairs into the room, and God help Jeff, the the steady cam guy. We did it 43 times. Yeah, <laughs> is that you, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> We did it like 43 times. We did. And we I actually going, started drawing on the walls. <laughs> we would, <laughs> just to amuse ourselves, just so that we would know that when we walked past that section of wall that we had actually written poo, we, <laughs> <laughs> cock. <laughs> we, just, we did, we were, we were going, we were going completely mad. Yeah. And I had to say, Danny was kind of in a frenzy. He was like, again, and I was like, dude, I think, you know, we need to stop. I was like, I think, you know, cause, and then you look around as well and the crew have seen it so many times. Oh. So that energy kind of lags. I mean, some directors will say the opposite. They'll like to do you know, 40 takes. But uh, I always like when the crew doesn't know exactly what's going on. Mm. And that's why, like, you know, I don't like to rehearse. It's like, no, shoot it the first time. If we're going to do it, might as well film it. Oh, yeah. Especially nowadays, yeah. it's digital. It mm. doesn't cost yeah. any money. You know, so, um, you know, and the focus puller's like, oh, Jesus Christ, don't, you know, mm. and the measuring tape's coming out. But it's like, <laughs> it doesn't matter if you get it wrong. Nobody's going to expect you to nail it the first time. But there is that beautiful, unexpected element. Uh, that, that that's true. Part. And, and, and on, 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 ta- on take one, everyone feels just sort of a little bit sick. So, so, and sometimes, you know, it's nice to see what's in the vomit. <laughs> so, my, f- my favorite show to watch on, my favorite show That's to watch the name on, of your memoirs. <laughs> see what's in the vomit. <laughs> That's okay. 
<laughs> no, I love watching CBS Sunday Morning, and I watched this morning and saw you on there, Kate. And I didn't yeah. know that you had sent Scott Rudin, the producer of this film, a photo of yourself basically like in character as Joanna with the glasses and the hair and everything in order to kind of make him comfortable with the idea of giving you this part. Obviously, it helped the fact that you've worked with him and you know him really well, but is that something you've done a lot? That's balls. I love it. Just to send the producer, this is what I look like in the, in the part. <laughs> well, I to tell the full story, sorry, Michael, because you've heard it loads of times and I'll try and cut it down short. Um, I, 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 heard, I had heard about the film because it had gone through various different versions of itself over, I don't know, probably an 18-month period. And I was in Australia um, working on, an, on a different film and the hair and makeup artist, Ivana Primorak, who was our hair and makeup artist on the Steve Jobs movie, she came into work one morning and she was all excited because overnight she had received some emails from Scott Rudin and Danny Boyle saying... We're, we're on, Michael Fassbender's gonna play Steve Jobs, can you do it, we really want you, come to San Francisco, we start in a month. So she's all excited, this is very much her job, and she's my friend, and so we're talking about her job that she's excited about doing. And I'm going, oh my God, wow, fantastic, Michael Fassbender, God, that's fucking brilliant, amazing, oh my God. So this goes on for a couple of days, and I come into work, and I get the latest installment of overnight emails from her and what's been happening. And then finally, after a few days, I said to her, what's the girl's part? because I knew there had to be one. And she said, well, she's Polish-Armenian, and she described the character, and I just thought, they're never going to ask me to play that part because I'm blonde and I've got boobs. And I don't, and I don't look like Joanna Hoffman, who's sort of five foot nothing, and, um, and we do look really very different. So I thought, well, in this moment of knowing that the role was as yet uncast, I might as well just go for it. I might as well just, you know, throw my hat in the ring and, and sort of give their creative imaginations a bit of a nudge. And so I, I, I did. My, my lovely husband, Ned, whilst I was on set filming, went out and grabbed me a couple of short, dark-haired wigs from a wig shop, which we had such a laugh kind of cutting up and trying to make them look like Joanna Hoffman. And, um, and I, just, I just went for it. I just took one picture of myself and, and just sent it to Scott. And, um, and I knew that he would know what I was up to in doing that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was just very, very lucky they sent me the script and then Danny came to Melbourne and, and we had a meeting and that was that. And I just, I, I just, I just knew I, I, I wanted to be a part of it. I knew it was going to be an extraordinary experience no matter what. And, you know, I think as, as an actor, it doesn't matter what level you're at, you know, you just can't have any vanity or egos about these things. Like, you know, what did I have to lose? Nothing. They might have just not responded to my email. So what, you know? Um, and just lucky me that I knew where to send it to, you know? Um, and I lucky just feel us, I so gotta lucky. Say. Lucky <laughs> us. Seriously. I mean, you know, the one thing. Aww. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's one thing, you know, and this is definitely an ensemble piece. I mean, you saw it like great, all great storytelling, you know, ensemble. It's about sort of a team working together. But Kate is just, you know, a natural leader and just naturally cares about people and about the production and making sure that everybody's sort of, you know, spirits are up. Uh, she was still calling Danny in the editing, going, are you all right? Is everything okay? You know, are you looking after yourself? <laughs> and I certainly, from my point of view, you know, she really sort of looked after me from the beginning, you know, had my back from, from day one. Oh. So uh, we were very, very lucky to, to, to get her. And plus, you know, you didn't have to look like Joanna Hoffman. I didn't look anything like Steve Jobs. So, so we were sort of keeping it <laughs> consistent. I think you kind of do, especially in Act 3. Um, yeah, Act 3, exactly. Amazing. Yeah. And anyone who's in the audience or watching this on YouTube, do yourself a favor, go to the CBS Sunday Morning website and watch the piece on Kate because they show the the, vid the picture that Yeah, they made me give it to them. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's pretty great. How much were you guys clued in from Danny Boyle on all of the cool things that he had up his sleeve as far as having the music be so different in all three acts, having it be filmed on different stock in all three acts? Did you guys know all the things he was going to do, or did you learn about that as the production went on or when you saw the finished product? He told us about the stock. I knew mm -hmm. about that, but yeah. then I didn't really know anything else. I had enough on my plate. <laughs> I was like, you do whatever you're going to do. Uh, you know, and, you know, obviously, sort of, you know, huge faith in him and, and trust. So, but that was the one thing I knew, but I didn't know. But also the other thing that was lovely for us was that Danny really did share his thoughts with us all the time, which directors sometimes don't do that. You know, often they'll, 
really kind of play their cards close to their chest. And I often mm -hmm. think, well, God, what, what are you? What, what's the point of doing that? Because you know, sometimes actors have really shit ideas, but they can also sometimes have you know ones that might be useful. And and Danny was brilliant at including us. And he would absolutely say as well, you know, I really think in Act One, you know, it's all about momentum. We just got to keep everyone moving. And <laughs> and then by the time Act Two came around, I do remember Michael and I both thinking, God, I hope he doesn't carry on with that exact same you know need to keep on moving because we were I think there were moments when we both felt we just got to stand still we just got to stop we just got to let the audience sort of be with these characters and luckily for us Danny actually was already thinking in that way too um, and re he really did listen yeah he really did didn't he After, you know during the rehearsal things you know if ever we said no oh, there's you know this is what we liked or didn't like or what was working or we felt wasn't working for us he took everything on board, yeah. adapted, adjusted. Uh, if it served, you know, the film. You know, if it doesn't serve the film, then you know, you get two fingers and told to sort of, you know, move on your way. But like he is very, as, as uh, Kate said, he's sort of very much a team, very much involves everybody and, and really cares about uh, what, how you feel and you know how it's sort of working for for all of us. How have you handled situations in the past where you felt like a director wasn't? opening up to you or, or wasn't inviting you into the process do you just kind of grin and bear it or do you speak up I think so I think a lot of the times actors like to talk because they're afraid of getting up there and doing it you know and I put <laughs> myself in the category so I generally just try to do stuff without telling them it's more fun as well mm. you know when you show them something without sort of having told them you can see them going oh what was that mm. or they're going what was that <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know, it's uh, it's it's. I think it's more fun again. It's sort of you know, what do they, would they, would they, you know, because you can talk about something, and you know, for as long as you want. But if you just sort of get up on his feet and it's not showing or it's not reading, then it doesn't really matter. So I always think just sort of showing is the best way. How about you? Well, <laughs> I have actually had a couple of experiences working with. Um, directors who actively don't want to know who, what who, I think. <laughs> and um, <laughs> why is that funny? <laughs> why is that actually funny? <laughs> um, no, but um, uh, no, I, 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 I have worked with a director who, I think it just probably came from insecurity, to be honest, on, 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 on the director's part, really had his idea, his vision, and his way of wanting to do something. And I did find that quite difficult, saying, oh, hey, I've had, a, you know, I've had an idea. That's, that's great. I don't need to know what it is. That, I, I actually have found that really difficult, because, because then what you do is you're sort of, you know, you're told almost not to really do the job, you know, it's a weird thing. And it's the same thing when, when a director says, which can happen often, I don't want you to prepare, I don't want you to prepare, I want you to just be loose, I want you to be, but that's good, you know, there's being loose, but you have to be prepared, I think, to be able to throw it all away again. I don't think you can just show up and sort of magic something out of absolutely nowhere at all. I mean, I can't, I'm sorry, I'm not, I can't do that. Um, so. So I am, a, I am actually kind of a big believer in, in, in preparation, even if you don't use any of it, because then what you're doing is you're covering yourself. Um, and so I think in situations like the one I was just describing where the director really didn't want to have actually any of the actor's ideas, I just sort of, I don't know, it just kind of made me retreat a bit really. And just Did you kind do of them anyway myself. though? Did you just do them anyway? I tried to sneak them in, yeah. <laughs> I tried to sneak them in. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, a couple last things, then I want to ask a couple of the questions that you all submitted um, for Michael and Kate. Uh, Kate, I did a, a phone interview with you. I remember this so because I felt so embarrassed, but it was also hilarious. You were about to win the Emmy for Mildred Pierce, which, like, duh, of course you were going to win the Emmy for Mildred Pierce. And, um, and I said something to you like, if you, win, if you win the Emmy next month, you're going to be halfway to the EGOT, you know, the Emmy, the Grammy, the Oscar, the Tony, and you're like, oh, love, I already have the Grammy. Because what you did for spoken word, and I was very embarrassed that I didn't know you had the Grammy. So now you're three quarters of the way. <laughs> I so, have actually got a Grammy. Isn't that weird? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean... You really I don't need to clap. <laughs> I feel like there's, a, there's been a, a reticence for you to do theater, Broadway at least, but now that you've done this, which is the closest thing to theater that's not theater, I feel like it's time for you to go for that tea. Uh, 
Because of course well, that's the only shit, reason to do Well shit, now I'm going to have to. <laughs> you know, I, I honestly, you know, I, I did a lot of theatre when I was younger, but much younger really as a teenager. The last play I did when, when I was uh, I was 18 years old and it was a production of What the Butler Saw by Joe Orton at the Manchester Royal Exchange way back before it was bombed. And um, it was um, it was a fantastic experience and I, I grew up watching my father on stage and my older sister and... Um, and uh, I think that was why, in a way, I particularly loved our experience of doing this film because I we were backstage in theatres all the time, and I would walk in and go, "Oh my god, that smell! That smell! There's just a smell of backstage that you can't even describe it, and it does something to one's fear. insides." <laughs> I think it is fear. It's fear mixed with dust. Um, it, it is fear. It is fear. You're right, but. Um, I I, th I I would really truly love to do theatre, and and I think the honest reason why that hasn't really happened for me yet is because I'm a I'm a mum, I'm a parent, and um, you know f at least filming you have weekends, and sometimes you're not in every day, and you can often make it back in time for bedtimes and things like that, and you know I think signing up to a minimum of three months of no weekends, Monday being your day off and never putting anyone to bed and reading bedtime stories, you know, these are really, really precious years in my children's lives, and I won't get those back. And so I have to wait, I think. <laughs> have to wait. <laughs> Okay, here are some of my favorite questions from the audience. This is a lovely, lovely thing to say from Lauren Simon, who says to Michael, you portrayed Steve Jobs so completely, became him so completely, that I asked your director whether he had used newsreel footage for one scene. Um, what is your process for disappearing into your role and creating such deep and realistic characters? Um, I think, you know, just, uh, again, really just, you know, staying with the script. And, um, you know, I kind of lived alongside my version of Steve Jobs for, you know, whatever it was, three to four months, and uh, you know, in the sort of month that I had before we started rehearsals, uh, you know, it's just me and him, <laughs> and uh, and the script, and really that's it. You know, there's not, and and by doing that, just sort of reading the script over and over again, it somehow I just feel like it sort of sinks into my enamel. <laughs> It's weird. It's like a piece of music or something if I was sort of a musician just to sort of spend the hours and hours with that piece over and over and over again. And then when I'm not reading the script, I'm going out for dinner, taking a break, I'm listening to something on my iPhone <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, a video of him or, uh, or I'm just sort of taking time away from that and I'm just thinking, oh, what would he do or what's my feeling or uh, just living with um, that person for, for, for that period of time very intensely, but it's really just the repetition of the script and over and over again getting a sort of something from that. Here's a question for you, Kate. It's either from a woman named Jean or a French gentleman named Jean. So, <laughs> and who wants to know, is your preparation for a role now different from how you prepared for roles when you were just starting out? No, it's actually exactly the same. Um, but, d but what has changed um, for me is really learning to let go of my nice, lovely preparation. <laughs> you know, just realizing that, oh God, I, you know, I, 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 there was no need to actually read that book. You know, because sometimes you don't have to do absolutely everything and knowing, w knowing what to focus on and what to just leave behind. Um, that's one thing that I've learned. But, you know, I was very, very, very fortunate because... I was cast in my first film role when I was 17 years old and it happened to be about a real life murder story and the immersion that happened um, for me and the other actress in the film, Melanie Linsky, was so extraordinary that that really taught me everything it was kind of my template for how to how to prepare and I and I do tend to write lots and lots of things down I found a notebook the other day actually that I'd kept on this film and um and I thought oh wow god I god I wrote down loads and a lot of it is just crap you know um but but I had written down things that I'm I'm so happy I wrote them down if only for the reason to share it now I wrote down that when Joanna um, started working as head of marketing. She had previously been an archaeologist and was really not going to be in this computer world at all, and she was not very tech savvy in the slightest. And she wrote down that she didn't. I wrote down that she didn't have much money, and that during that time, at the very beginning of it all, she wrote, "Jobs was lovely," 
And I had forgotten that she'd said that. And she also had said that he had he reminded her of lots of different members of her own family. And I'd also forgotten that she said that. And and I, so I'm so glad that I, I had those because they all would have meant something or other at the time, you know. Um, and so the answer to the question is no, the process is exactly the same really. Can, can I jump in on that and just say, that, you know, Kate is a, an excellent technician, you know. It's like very... Uh, impressive to see that, whether it be from an accent or that sort of research into the character or physicality uh, or just handling the text or the scene. It's, uh, it's something you know, it's really sort of impressive to see. And also something about Joanna Hoff Hoffman, which has always stayed with me, which is when we were talking to her and she had her shares in Apple and she lost them. Oh my God. And she didn't care. It sort of was like, oh, I put them somewhere and I don't know where they are. No, but don't you remember she... I would have been pulling my hair out. She you know, said so this... She, no, no, do you remember, her, though, that yeah, she said... Funny, well, there was this... There, there was a line in the in in the film, it's, it's still in there, where she says, you come to my apartment at 1 a.m. and yeah. cleaned it, so tell me where the boundary is. And we were all like, Aaron, what's that line? What, what, what do you mean he went to her apartment at 1 a.m. and cleaned it? He said, exactly that. She told me that Steve showed up, they were having a meeting, and, uh, and he showed up and he said, I can't, jo Joanna, I can't work like this, you know? I, it's, I, this is just such a mess. And so I said to him, well, just clean it then. And so, so he had cleaned this apartment and it was out of that story. He said, you know, I think he lost my Apple stock when he was cleaning the apartment. It was nowhere and I've never found it since. And we were like, oh, <gasps> <laughs> Oh my God! Well, first, I just want to I just want to interject and say, if any of you have not seen the movie that she's talking about, which is Heavenly Creatures with Melanie Linsky, <laughs> you've got to yeah. see it. One of Peter Jackson's earliest movies, really, really good. The, first of all, I just want to listen to you tell stories in multiple accents for the rest of the day, <laughs> which brings me to, and we're almost done. Anyone who's worried about timing, I'm almost done. But I, so there's just two great questions from two a 10 and 11 year old that are in the audience, and this fits right in with what you were just doing. So Bianca is a 10 year old SAG member. She loves acting, and she wants to know how hard is it to lose your accent, and I'll, which is. Apparently not hard because you just did it. And I want you to answer that, but also Hunter, who's 11, wants to know what kind of advice can you give an 11-year-old like me who's just starting, who's in the second year in the industry, and oh. what keeps you motivated with all the rejection? First of all, if you've had that much rejection, come on, don't give up at all, but let, let's let them tell people that. Hey. How do you Hi. deal with it? What is the secret to getting through all the rejection? You know, Hunter... Oh, self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, don't listen to him. Um, <laughs> Hunter, you know what the most important thing is? The most important thing is that you believe that you're meant to be an actor, don't you? Well, then you will be. That's the most That's important right. thing. And that, that is the key thing to remember. And kind of trick yourself too. Like, when you go into auditions... Say to yourself, they should be lucky to have me. You just say that, you're not smug about it, you just quietly say that to yourself and remember that they would be lucky to have you, okay? That's what you remember. That's right. You and you're 11, by the way, I think I'll be getting advice off you in a couple of years. So, uh, you know, I think as well, just have fun, you know? Just have fun with it, you know? It should be fun. Mm. Yeah. And, um, and unfortunately, you know, I think, you know, rejection is just part and parcel of it, you know? But it's, it's a also big a good thing. It's yeah. also a good thing, rejection, because it does teach you how to get that little bit stronger and just know that, well, that was an experience and you'll just move on and you learn from it and take things from those moments, you know? And also, you know, the fact, you know, they could be looking for somebody with red hair or, you know, two feet taller or whatever happened to them that day. There's so many things that are out of your control. I think just concentrate on the scene, what it's about, what you're doing, you know, where are you coming from, where are you going, what are you trying to get in the scene, all those little things that are about the scene, that'll take away the fear, the nerves, concentrating, okay, where have I just come from? Have I come from the store? Did I buy a, a, an ice cream on the way to this place before I arrived? Mm. How does this person in the room that I'm doing the scene with make me feel? What do I want from them? How do I go about getting what I want from them? Mm. All those things will take away all the sort of nerves and the fear. Mm. And, uh, and then you just do your thing. And as long as you do your thing and enjoy it, then you've done your job.
then they'll be picking you for whatever reasons they'll they will be or not and but you've done your thing so that's right yeah that's right Wait, what about Bianca? And and Bianca wants to know how tough it is to lose. First of all, Bianca and Hunter, you're There's way too Bianca young to be there, watching look. this movie. <laughs> this is radar. Where is Bianca? She wants to know how hard it is to lose the, your accents because you both did it. It's easy for her, not so easy for no, me. No, it's not easy. <laughs> That's not true. It's easy for you. <laughs> I bet none of you knew that he was Irish. <laughs> um, well, I, I actually don't find accents um, easy. I have to really work hard on them and you do have to put in the work and the time and it isn't something you can just kind of invent but I think it's whatever you need I mean like Michael was saying that he would listen to Steve you know just talking on on, on his iPod and I would do the same with Joanna I had lots of recordings of her and so the rhythm of her voice and certain sounds that she would make and just honestly practicing it over and over again um and f fortunately for me, actually, both of us, we both had dialect coaches who w would help us to stay on top of it. Because sometimes when you're in the moment, you might slip a word here or a word there. And, and to have that person sort of pull you back and help you shape the accent as well. But I will tell you something that a dialect coach has told me, which I find incredibly useful. When you're nervous about a dialect, what we tend to do is just speak really, really quickly and hope that the things that <laughs> you're not so good at, you might get away with. Never go faster than you can, which is kind of a pain too, because it means you really have to make sure you're doing it. Um, actually, I remember Sarah Snook, the actress who plays Andrea Cunningham in this. Um, she's actually Australian. And... She was a little bit nervous. She's done American before really, really well, but she was just a little bit nervous, naturally. I mean, everyone is. On day one, you open your mouth and you think, oh, everyone's listening to me, and they just think I'm awful. Um, and she was nervous, and, and she was speaking too quickly. And, and, she, and the dialect coach who was on the set did say to her, you know, slow down, take your time. And, and it really, really helped her a great deal, I know. Um, so, yeah, never go faster than you can. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, you know, just sort of, uh, you know, to add quickly to that, it's just boring, but it's the repetition, you know, like everything. Let's say, you know, a baseball player will practice his pitch, his or her pitch, every sort of day, you know, over and over again, or a football player will do the same, or hockey, or, or musician. It's, you know, and it's kind of the same, I feel, for acting. It's the sort of repetition, you got to, you know, really sort of just put in the hours, and it's kind of boring, but... Uh, <laughs> It's sort of essential unless you're just one of those brilliant people that can sort of do accents that sort of drop a, of a hat. But, you know, can I just say to you young guys in this room, sorry, I do have to add something. You know, acting is the most incredible job in the world to do. And don't let anyone knock you. Just keep going because it's worth it, really worth it. And I just do have to say that because I, I love it. I've been doing it since I was nine years old. And it's it's just fantastic. Mm. So you've chosen the right path for sure. I love it. <laughs> Final thing. The thing I love about the relationship between these two characters in the movie is that I feel like Joanna is the one only person who can get through to Steve. Who She's like the Steve Jobs whisperer, if you will. <laughs> so here's my question. Who is that one person in each of your lives? Depends on the circumstance. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I have to say, I was very sort of, I had real uh, doubts about doing this job. Um, and uh, I, I was really on the edge, and it was my, f my dad that uh, said to me, you know, you have to do it. Um, you know, it's your job. As, you, know, uh, <laughs> uh, you have to do it, it's your job. No, you know, he's like, you, you know, this is sort of the thing, you know, and you're, there was sort of, you know, feelings about whether, you know, people would be offended about, you know, the, the portrayal and everything else. And he was like, look, you know, you're like a journalist, you're a storyteller, and it's your job, and you have to do this. And um, so I guess my parents really um, have always. I've always taken what they say to be you know, very valid because I guess, you know, they've known me since I was born. <laughs> Funny how that works. Kate? Um, yeah, I actually have to say my dad as well. I, I, yeah, yeah. Honestly, he's a really amazing man and 
he was um he was an actor is an actor and an extraordinary jazz singer actually um and you know he he's always been the one who i don't know he can just the uh, a, a look or a wink even sometimes um i just know that he's i just know that he's kind of on me you know mm. um which is fantastic um even talking to him on the phone you know if we're miles and great distances apart you know he'll just say one or two small things and it's like okay that's the that's the leveler right there yeah we're quite lucky your to dad have that, and actually. my dad should get together they should <laughs> <laughs> they would end up in a bar yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. yeah. well your dads have inspired you and you've just inspired hundreds of people today thank you so much for your time thank you have a great day everybody